All right, so if you are just joining us, um, welcome to the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium on Live, uh, our class human, or sorry, Vermont Human Landscapes with Michael Salmonello. We'll start um, in just a few minutes. It's geared towards grades three through five. Uh, so if you are attending on Zoom, please feel free to mouse down and use the chat function or the Q&A function, um, just a few spots over. Um, we'll have both of those open and I will um, try to get Michael's attention and answer some of those questions. If you're joining us on YouTube, feel free to write questions in the chat box there. And again, I will get those questions over to Michael uh, to answer for this class. Uh, please see our schedule for um, more classes um, happening next week on our virtual learning page. Uh, and for now, I will hand the class right over to Michael. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, so hello everybody. Uh, again, my name is Michael. Um, welcome to this class about the human history of Vermont. Um, what that means is we're going to be talking about how human beings have changed the landscape and the ecology of Vermont over the past uh, 12,000 years since humans have been living here. Um, but in order to cover that, the whole range of time between the time humans first began to live here and now, we, we have to start maybe even a little bit earlier than that to the time where the, Verm the Vermont that we know today was, was really formed. Um, about 15,000 years ago, uh, there was a massive, very slow event that formed the entire landscape and ecology of the Vermont that we know today. Uh, 15,000 years ago, it was the last ice age. Um, 15,000 years is just about the last glacial maximum. So that's the, the very worst part, uh, the very furthest that the glaciers in the ice age descended uh, down from the polar regions in the north. Um, the last glacier to come down was the Laurentide Ice Sheet. 20,000 years ago, about, it began. Uh, it took 5,000 years to extend from the, uh, the always frozen regions of the world in the polar areas, so north of Greenland, north of the Yukon and Nunavut. It took 5,000 uh, 5, years for that massive ice sheet to slowly crawl down through Vermont until it stopped at the very edge of Long Island Sound. If you go and look at a map, you can kind of tell that Long Island itself, the island is a big shovel full of dirt that this glacier had pushed along with it and left right at that point. So of course, if that's where the glacier ended, it, then it took 5,000 years for it to reach that point as the earth began to warm up again. It took another 5,000 years for that glacier to melt away. Um, it was a uh, in some places, a, a mile high sheet of ice. So you could imagine just how long that would take to, uh, to disappear. Um, and as that glacier melted, slowly receding back up north, um, it drastically changed the landscape. The mountains, the white and green mountains in Vermont and New Hampshire, used to be taller than the Himalayas, the mountain chain that Everest is, uh, is a part of the tallest standing mountain in, in the world. Um, when the glaciers came through, those massive sheets of ice scraped down those mountains, essentially pushed them over and carved them out. Um, and, so, and now, of course, they're much smaller. But we also know that the landscape of Vermont is very rocky and very hilly and filled with, uh, filled with rivers, the Connecticut River being the biggest of those rivers. All of those landforms were made by this glacier. Um, really good examples that are very striking and easy to see of landscape that the glacier left is if you've ever been to Lake Willoughby or Crystal Lake right near it. Those are glacial lakes that were carved out by this massive wall of ice. And Lake Willoughby is 300 feet deep. That's how deep that glacier had carved out that land, that landscape. It's 300 feet deep, and if you've ever been there, you've seen uh, Mount Horror and Mount Pisgah on either side of the lake, and it looks like those two mountains were cut directly in half, like they sp split and fell apart right down the middle. And that is because the glacier literally split those mountains when it rolled on through, and the water that was 
left behind as that glacier melt melted filled in these large and very deep lakes like Lake Willoughby and Crystal Lake. I'm sure you are all familiar with the Connecticut River. It's the, it's the largest waterway in all of Vermont. That river was formed also by the glacier, but if you were living in Vermont 15,000 years ago, it, it wouldn't have been a river. It would have been a massive glacial lake called Glacial, glacial Lake Hitchcock. Imagine if the whole Connecticut River extending from the Canadian border all the way down to Long Island Sound, if it was this giant massive lake that took up most of New England. It was an inland sea. A lot of it was actually salt water. Um, it was bigger than most of the, I think all but one of the Great Lakes. It was a massive lake and it was salt water. And you guys might have heard that there, there used to be whales in Vermont. And that's quite true. Back during this period, right after the glacier melted, there was so much water here in Vermont. There was a real sea, and there were whales living really right in your backyard, basically. Um, you can still find whale, ancient whale skeletons all throughout Vermont today. If, there's a, if you've ever driven, a, um, what is it, 89 or 81, down into Burlington, there's that whale statue which commemorates people finding those whale skeletons there. That, that's very cool. You, do, <laughs> you would never think that whales used to live in Vermont, but the landscape was very, very, very different back during this time. Uh, it was so different. It was so cold and rocky, and there was very little trees or plants. Humans could not have lived in Vermont even if they tried. Um, during that time, there were no human beings even in the entire United States, and it took thousands of years for them to, to reach Vermont and for them to be able to live there. You, you could imagine that right after this glacier went back up into the north and melted, Vermont was just, it looked like a gravel pit. There were rocks strewn everywhere. There was lots of melted water left over from the glacier. And it took a long time for trees to regrow and for animals from the south where the glacier never hit, for these animals to move back into Vermont. And very slowly, Vermont started to look a little bit more like what we know it as today, with you know deep, large forests and lots of animal life. So if the glacier left about 15,000 years ago, the first humans came to Vermont about 12,000 years ago. So that's a 3,000 year difference. It took 3,000 years for those humans to get here. And you might know them as the Abenaki people. They were a group of Native Americans who settled in Vermont all of the Native Americans came to America from Asia over a land bridge that used to exist between Alaska and what's now Russia today. Of course, now with Russia and Alaska aren't connected, but back then it was. And humans traveled millions of miles to get all the way, well, not, I'm sorry, not millions of miles, but thousands of miles, hundreds of thousands of miles <laughs> to get to um, Vermont. We have a, a question, and I don't know if this is one um, that would be a part of your lesson, but uh, someone was asking, how did the Ice Age start? Ooh, that's a, oh, that's a good question. I should have mentioned that, right. So you may have heard that the Earth actually goes through cycles of being cold and warm. Right now, we're going through a warming cycle. Everybody's talking about global warming, uh, and it's, it's a simple fact that we're in one of those warming cycles now. The Earth has gradually been getting warmer for the past couple thousand years, and humans have contributed it. Oh, humans have helped it to get warmer a little bit. You guys have probably heard about that. But it's natural for the world to get warmer and then colder over thousands and thousands of years. There have been lots of ice ages over time. About every 20,000 years, an ice age happens. So it's been about 10,000 years, well, it's about 20,000 years since the last ice age which means that uh, the next ice age is coming up in the next couple thousand years, right? So because the Earth gets warmer and colder and warmer and colder every couple thousand years, that's why those ice ages happen. Any other questions? Uh, not currently, but we'll, we'll, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we were talking about the Abenaki people, the Native Americans who first came to live here in Vermont. And if you know anything about the Native Americans, you'll know that they were a group of people who didn't change the land nearly as much as modern people do today. 
Today, we, we build houses and we build factories and we build highways and roads and cities, and we, we change the land that we live on a lot. The Native Americans had a very different attitude um, towards how they used the land. They didn't build permanent houses during the winter time. They would all live together in large, long houses that were easy to, to build and then take down at the end of the winter. And then during the summer months, they would all split apart from one another into their family groups, and they would go and they would build little summer houses that they would live in for a little while. And then they would take down and move them again. You guys have probably heard of wigwams, right? Those small summer houses were called wigwams. And if a family had just taken down their wigwam and moved, it, it would be almost impossible for you to even recognize that there had been a house there maybe just a few days ago. Here, nowadays, if you, if you knock down, <laughs> if you demolish a house, you can tell that somebody was living there, obviously. So the Native Americans didn't change the land nearly as much as we do today. They didn't even farm very much. They got most of their food from gathering and from hunting. So these Native American people lived in Vermont for thousands of years without changing it very much. It was only in the 1600s, so only 400 years ago, that European people really moved into Vermont and that's where the change really all starts to begin. So to me, it's crazy to think that Vermont looked almost the same for thousands of years after the glaciers left and the Native Americans were living here. Only in the past couple hundred years has Vermont changed to how we see it today. So I have a little slideshow here to kind of give you yeah. an idea of all of this change. And we have a question saying, is that good or bad? So I think maybe you'll, you'll be able to answer it with some of your slides. Yeah. Um, and another question was, what, is, what causes the earth to warm up and cool down? Which um, you, know, you may be able to answer, or that may be a uh, Mark Breen or one of the yeah. major <laughs> questions. <laughs> that, that, the answer to that question is, is, very, is quite complicated. But the earth's atmosphere, all the gases in the earth's atmosphere, they're all heated up by the sun, right? And over thousands of years, the rotation of the earth around the sun actually changes a little bit. It moves back and forth further and closer to the sun. When the earth is closer to the sun, it's warmer, of course. We get more heat and light from the sun, but when the earth is moving away from the sun, it's going to get colder naturally. There's, there's a couple other things that go into what makes an ice age, uh, what, well, what, what goes into those cycles too, but unfortunately we don't really have a lot of time to talk about them now. Um, the other question that I heard was, are, are these changes to the land good or bad, right? So that, that is an extremely important question. Hopefully what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of minutes helps you to answer that question for yourselves, really. You will be able to see some images here of how we've changed the land and you should get a sense of, of, uh, of whether it is good or bad. Uh, I will tell you even before we get started that in the past 400 years, humans have changed the land in a pretty negative way, in a pretty bad way. But having said that, nowadays in the modern era, we've realized the damage that we've done to the landscape in Vermont and we're doing a lot of work to try to make it healthy again. So there is good news and bad news about how humans have changed the land. And we're gonna start that discussion with this guy right here. Can you guys see Samuel here on your screen? Excellent. So this man is Samuel de Champlain. You're probably familiar with his name. The largest lake in Vermont is named after him, Lake Champlain. This man is a French explorer who first came to Vermont in 1609. He, he claims that he discovered Lake Champlain, which is kind of ridiculous, of course, because the native Abenaki people have been living on Lake Champlain for thousands of years. It was, it was really kind of a silly, short-sighted idea for Samuel de Champlain to say that he was the first person to discover it. Uh, but that kind of attitude about ignoring the Native Americans is going to come up again and again in this, in this history of European settlers. So Samuel de Champlain came and explored Vermont, and he was interested in making maps of the area 
and also seeing how much money people could make if they moved into Vermont. Particularly, they were interested in trapping furs, hunting animals for their fur. And of course, we know that Vermont is very rich in animal life, and particularly in animals like beavers and otters and mink and uh, fisher, which are all animals where their fur is worth an awful lot of money. So Samuel explored this whole region, and when he went back to France, he told all of his explorer friends, hey, there's this excellent land where no other Europeans are living here in America. People should move here, and they can make a lot of money trapping these animals. So, oh, let's see if I can get this. And I, have, ah. I do have a quick question. Someone okay. was saying, you know, didn't... Uh, didn't Samuel see all of the Native Americans, which um, he did, but maybe just didn't really observe that they were other humans that he should share space with. <laughs> that's, that's right, yeah. Sam, Samuel de Champlain and a lot of the other French explorers, they thought that they were, they were more important than the Native Americans. When they came here and they saw how the Native Americans were using the land, the Native Americans were kind of being very gentle with the land. And the French explorers were saying, oh, these Native Americans, they don't deserve the land that they're living on because they're not using it to, they're not using all the land, all that the land has to offer. So the Europeans, the French people thought that they had more right to that land than the Native Americans did. That might seem like a very strange attitude to you, but that's really how those people thought back then. It's a very strange way to think yeah <laughs> but when 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 samuel champlain did show up here in vermont this would have been mostly what it looked like the picture on the left here you guys can see this is a large forested area where the native americans would have been living and they would have been clearing very small plots of land for for their seasonal gardens really they didn't have big farms like we do today they pretty much just lived off of small family gardens the map that you see on the right shows when European settlers first started to show up here in Vermont. The darker the green color is, the earlier those settlers came here. So you can see that in like the Burlington area, people were here pretty early. That was an early trading post where people would trade for furs. Lots of French people, lots of early English settlers. And you can also see that on the east side of the state, on the right side, it's also very dark. That's the area of the Connecticut River Valley where there was lots of attractive land for farming. Up in the middle though, like in St. Johnsbury and north of that, people didn't move to that area until hundreds of years later, until not until after the Revolutionary War. And the reason for that is that nobody actually really wanted to go up and live in that land, in those northern highlands of Vermont, where a lot of you probably live today. That land was considered not so good for farming. It's very rocky soil. Uh, it's hard to irrigate. It's very, there's lots of slopes, lots of mountains. So people didn't want to settle there, but at the end of the Revolutionary War, George Washington actually gave out that land for free to a lot of his soldiers. <laughs> so all of those soldiers after the Revolutionary War, they said, hey, it's free land. So they decided to move up and settle in Vermont. And slowly, they started to change this Native American land and kind of make it their own. Here are some pictures of the actual Abenaki people who used to live here. And you can tell from the way that they're dressed that they <laughs> relied a lot on the natural environment, right? They're wearing clothes that are made out of buckskin, right? Out of deer hide. And they wear ornaments that are all made out of natural things. There aren't manufactured clothes. They're very natural clothes. Do we have any questions before we move on there? Uh, let's see, we, whoop, we've got one. Uh, what would have happened if they did not, um, let's see. I think what the person's trying to ask is, an earlier question was, um, would they, uh, you know, would Vermont have still been settled if Samuel de Champlain didn't find it? And I said, well, he was just the first explorer to find it, but now they're asking, you know, what would happen if, not everyone got diseases from Europe, um, and and what did they do with the Native Americans when they moved there? So, ah, those, so those, yeah, those are those are good questions. They're good questions with sad answers, unfortunately. So, when the Native Americans were living here in all of Vermont, 
there were only about 10,000 Abenaki people in the entire state. That's about the maximum their whole population was. Today, there's 600,000 people in Vermont. So that's 60 times at least more, more people today than there were back then. There were not very many Native Americans living here. So when the Europeans first started to move here, unfortunately, the European people had diseases, some you may have heard of like smallpox, that the Native Americans had never been exposed to before. It's, it's a little bit like what we're seeing today in the news, right? Coronavirus is a disease that, well, this type of coronavirus is a disease that humans have never been exposed to before. So a lot of people are getting it and it's a very terrible disease that's unfortunately killing a lot of people. Smallpox was the same thing for these Native Americans. And unfortunately, a lot of these Native Americans began to die just because they were having contact with European people. And even really even sadder than that, as all of these Abenaki people were getting sick, the Abenaki had really like, a, a, they were a, a rival or a mortal enemy. If you've ever heard of the Iroquois or the Iroquois, they were a group of people that lived in New York, another group of Native Americans, and they were a very warlike people. They, f they fought a lot and they liked to take land and, and goods from other Native American people. So as these Abenaki people started to get very sick from the European diseases, the Iroquois noticed that the Abenaki were weak and they actually stormed a lot of Abenaki villages and drove them off their land. So within just a hundred years after European settlers really started to come to Vermont, all, well, not all, but almost all of the Abenaki people living here left, they fled. Most of them fled north to Canada, to Quebec. And today, a lot of those Abenaki people still are living in Quebec uh, and they trace their roots back to Vermont. So that's kind of the, the whole sad story there. Um, there are very few Abenaki people living here in Vermont still today. We have a, a couple more um, questions just based on thinking, you know, um, weren't the natives smarter than the explorers? But I think you sort of explained that disease and also um, explorers having guns and things like that, and also other tribes coming in and taking over were yeah. some of the issues. Um, and someone was asking about, you know, scalping. I'm not sure what some of the different ways that they, <laughs> uh, their warfare took place, but maybe you, you might know the answer. I'm not sure. <laughs> that, that, the, the scalping thing is a famous Iroquois, Iroquois tactic. It was just to scare, to scare their enemies. They would, they would take the scalps of, of defeated, of dead soldiers and wear them to, to scare people. Um, the Abenaki didn't, didn't do so much of that, not as much as, uh, as the Iroquois people did. Uh, but there's a, there is a famous story about Samuel Champlain. He actually, he made an alliance with the Abenaki for a little while. He became friends with them. And the Abenaki asked Samuel de Champlain and all of his soldiers to help them fight the Iroquois. And <laughs> the way that the Native Americans were more used to fighting uh, is because they didn't want lots of people to die. They would send just a few of their best warriors to fight one another and to see which side was the strongest. They wouldn't send all of their people all at once to fight one another because you know they wanted to keep most of their people safe. But the European way of fighting is, is very different. Um, so <laughs> when the Abenaki asked Samuel de Champlain to go fight the Iroquois, Samuel de Champlain took all of his soldiers and all of the guns and they killed every single Iroquois pe person in this whole in this whole village. And so that was very bad. The, <laughs> the, that made the Abenaki realize like, oh, oh my gosh, these people are, are not good people. They're not smart people, the, the Europeans. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that is true. The, the Europeans and the Native Americans had very different ways of life. Um, in a lot of ways, the Abenaki were a lot smarter than the French explorers who came to visit. They certainly knew a lot more about the land and how to keep the land healthy than the explorers did. Yeah. We do have um, just another related question. Um, is, is this where the, does the Trail of Tears have something to do with 
oh. you know, these native peoples leaving, which I associate much more with Georgia, yeah. tribes from Georgia. Right. You might know oh, right. that one Georgia. too. Yeah, the South, right. Yeah, so the, the, uh, these tribes weren't so much involved with the Trail of Tears, mostly because they were forced off of their land before that happened. This is all about 100 years before the whole Trail of Tears uh, story, unfortunately. So, so no, the, these people weren't involved in that. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, not currently. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So move on here. So if we look at this village here, I'm sure you could all tell me whether this is a Native American village or a European village. <laughs> of course, you can tell that this is a, these, these are European people, right? They're building permanent houses. Those houses look very hard to pack up at the end of the season and take with you to a new place and set them back up again. These houses are built to stay in the exact same place all the time. They're building roads. The Native Americans never built roads. The most they ever had were, were paths through the woods, really hiking trails. That's all, that they, that's all that they built to get around, and they would use canoes to go up and down rivers. This picture that you're looking at right now is actually Main Street of St. Johnsbury in the 1870s. So that's 150 years ago, about. Right at the top of the street there, you can see the Athenaeum. That's the library in St. Johnsbury, if you've ever been there. It's a really pretty building, but you could probably tell that even today there is a lot, there are many more buildings on Main Street than there are back then here in this picture, right? So these Europeans changed the land significantly. They had to cut down hundreds and hundreds of trees, not only to clear the land for this village, but also for building materials to build all of these houses. Just the buildings that you see here, it might have taken thousands upon thousands of trees to build all of this. So as a result, so here's Railroad Street at about the same time. Again, these are large buildings. You can see a lot of these buildings still today because they were, they were built very well because of how European people built their buildings. Um, but the trade-off for having long-lasting buildings is having to destroy a lot of the environment. Unfortunately, speaking of destroying the environment, this is a picture of the Fairbanks scale factory. So this is really what made St. Johnsbury a, a wealthy and prosperous town. The Fairbanks family moved to St. Johnsbury in the 1800s, and they were Thaddeus and Erastus Fairbanks. They're, they're great names, and they might be recognizable names if you live in St. Johnsbury. There are two brothers that started this business, built this massive factory, and built very large scales for weighing things and sent them all over the world. And so you can see just in this picture, the way that they had to change the environment in order to build this factory. Certainly you can see all of these large smokestacks. Back then they were burning charcoal and wood and maybe a little bit later, even the kind of oil that we burn today to heat our houses. All of that burning material as you can see, is, is sending smoke and smog up into the atmosphere. Today, we know that this is causing, well, it's helping global warming, which is a bad thing, not so good for the environment. But also, imagine if you lived in a house in St. Johnsbury, just right next to this factory. You would be breathing in all of that smoke all day long. And we know today that breathing in carbon smoke, those carcinogens, can cause cancer. But back in the 1880s, Nobody knew really what cancer was, and we certainly didn't know how to treat it. So not only was the factory like this bad for the environment, but it was also bad for individual people's health. On top of that, if you look on the right hand of this image here, you can kind of tell that there is a river that flows straight through this factory between all of the buildings. That's the Pasumpsic River. It's really the river that St. Johnsbury is built around as a town. And the people in the factory used that river to power a lot of their machines. If you've ever seen water wheels, which of course use the force of moving water to, uh, to you can use it to run a saw or large machines, a big grinding mill, anything like that. So they used the river to, um, to run their machinery 
but they also use their river kind of as as their uh, as their trash pile. All of the all of the the waste that they made in the factory, all of the ashes that were burned out in the in the uh, in the furnaces, they would just dump it all into the river. And people back then didn't really know any better, but dumping all of that into the river killed billions of fish and amphibians uh, all down the entire Pasumpsic River. They were really poisoning the river without having a good understanding of what they were doing. Back then, people thought that, you know, if you dump something in the river, the river is going to carry it away, and then it's not a problem anymore, right? So people really, back then, they thought of it as a healthy way of dealing with their trash, uh, but in reality, it was a really terrible thing to do. It was, it was really deadly for so many so many creatures that lived in the water, and also for people living downstream that relied on that water to feed their, to, you know, water their cows and their sheep, and also to get water in their own homes. So it was really a, quite a deadly thing. Also, of course, they actually had to change the river itself by building bridges and dams and, uh, and levees and embankments people were able to change the direction of the river, to block off the river, to stop the river. Um, basically to move the river however they wanted so that they could basically make the river do what they needed it to do. Whether they needed it to power a paddle wheel or to block it off so that it didn't flood the town. People did that by building dams and bridges and things like this, but over time, unfortunately, moving rivers like this destroyed one of the most important environments that really exists in Vermont. So what you're seeing now, this is, of course, you guys might recognize it as a swamp or a wetlands, right? All around the Pasumpsic River would have been the floodplains where, you know, you guys know, I'm sure, in the springtime when all snow melts on the northern mountains, that water rushes down the mountains into the rivers and it causes those rivers to flood seasonally. As a result of all of that extra water, these big marshes form. All of that water has to drain out somewhere and it ends up in bogs, wetlands, areas like this. St. Johnsbury, hundreds of years ago, before we built houses there, it all used to look like this. It was all a wetland that would flood depending on the season. And these areas, marshes, are like, are like nature's cities. There are more different kinds of plants and animals living in marshes than there are in pretty much any other kind of, of biome or any kind of region anywhere else in Vermont. These are the hotspots, the place to go if you want to see rare birds or rare amphibians or rare fish, anything like that. But unfortunately, because, because of the way that we build our towns, Hey, stop. <laughs> because of the way we build our towns, we've destroyed a lot of these very valuable environments, right? And we can't get them back. We can't rebuild a wetland. They're very complicated. They're very, yeah. It's impossible for humans to do the work that's necessary to rebuild these very special environments. So it's a sad thing that we've destroyed them. And of course, along with those environments, that land, we've destroyed the plants and animals that live there. So here is, of course, a beaver. We all know, know and love the beaver. About 80% of the ponds that are in Vermont today were built by beavers. They change their environment a lot, just like humans do. But there was a time about 150 years ago where beavers were completely extinct in Vermont. There was not a single beaver that anybody had seen for 100, for 100 years. My grandfather, who grew up in New England here, and his whole, and he, he, he was a trapper when he was uh, a kid, so he was always in the woods and he was always trapping animals and finding animals. In his whole childhood, he never saw a single beaver or a single turkey, or also, there's something else he never saw. I always forget what it is. <laughs> Well, anyway, he never saw a single beaver or a single turkey. Nowadays, we see turkeys all the time in Vermont, and we see the signs of beavers everywhere. We can find beaver dams and beaver lodges. We can see the results of how they change their environment. They're, they're kind of hilarious animals. They're very cute, and they're very, very, very smart. But how do I stop sharing my screen? Okay. But why were these beavers extinct? Why? Of course, you know, 
people made them extinct. <laughs> the beavers didn't go extinct just on their own. And the reason that they went extinct is because the European people who moved here to New England, to Vermont particularly, they hunted these beavers ruthlessly until every single beaver was gone, every single beaver that they could find. The reason that they hunted them was for their pelts, for their fur. Beaver fur, if you've ever gotten to feel it, is, is wonderfully soft. It's, it's very, very nice, and it's completely waterproof. Beavers spend 90% of their time underwater. They're really excellent swimmers. They can hold their breath for 30 minutes. Even all through the wintertime, they're swimming underneath the frozen ponds that they live on. So they need their fur to be waterproof. But unfortunately for them, as a result, <laughs> that fur is very nice and soft. I wish you could, could feel this fur, but unfortunately, you know, only I get to feel it for right now. <laughs> but let's see if I can get you to see this here. Beaver fur is special because it has this outer fur that might look a lot like the fur your dog has. But can you see that very curly under fur? the inner fur. My camera is a little bit dark, unfortunately. But you can kind of just see it as I move the fur out of the way like that, those very curly parts. That fur is extremely soft. It's called the down fur, kind of like the down on a goose, the under feathers. This is the under fur. And this fur is totally waterproof. That's the stuff that keeps the beavers dry. But that's also a very popular kind of fur for making clothing. So this is a real old beaver fur hat. And these hats were so popular in Europe all throughout the 17 and 1800s that a beaver fur hat like this was extremely expensive. And if you were a wealthy person, a fancy person, and you wanted to show everybody how wealthy and important you were, you would want to have beaver fur clothing. It's a little bit like having a fancy car today. Having a coat or a hat made of beaver fur showed that you were very wealthy and important. So everybody wanted one. And because of that, because every single person wanted one, they killed almost every single beaver in, in Europe. I think, I think they did go extinct in Europe for a while. And in most countries in Europe, they still are extinct. They, aren't, they can't live there anymore. Um, and once they had killed all the beavers in Europe, of course, they turned to America and they made beavers extinct in all of New England as well. So fortunately though, today beavers are back around and there are lots of them, depending on what state you're in. They, the beavers certainly didn't do that all on their own. They needed help from human beings. Eventually people living in Vermont and New England kind of wised up and they realized that they had destroyed all the beavers. And as a result, that was also destroying the rest of their environment. Without any beavers, there were no animals to maintain all of these dams that the beavers had built over hundreds of years. And those dams were starting to break and they were flooding people's homes and they were even flooding whole villages because the beavers were gone. So that made people kind of realize that we need the beavers back. And the way that we brought them back, actually this is a little bit hilarious, but people would go up to Canada, remote places in Canada, and trap beavers. They would take a male beaver and a female beaver and they would put them in a cage together and then they would fly over Vermont in a, in a bush plane and they would drop that crate with a parachute out in the most remote places of Vermont where people didn't live. So they were basically airdropping beavers all over the state to try to get them to reestablish a community and to have them all come back. And even though that seems like a kind of ridiculous solution, it really did work. Um, today we have beavers all over and they're very successful, right? New beaver ponds are being formed, old beaver ponds are being taken care of by these beavers. So it's a real success story. But unfortunately the beaver isn't the only animal that has this kind of, uh, this kind of tale of extinction, right? Otters are another aquatic mammal with, uh, with a very soft coat, waterproof coat. Uh, they're related to weasels and minks. So they're predators, but they were also hunted, not for their meat, but for their coats. Also though, otters are back in Vermont because humans have helped them come back after they went extinct. <laughs> One animal that was actually helped by humans moving into Vermont and changing the land 
was the skunk. Now, you guys might know that skunks are nocturnal. Of course, they only come out at night, so they're not bothered by humans very much. They're sleeping when we're active. And skunks are quite lazy animals, and they love to eat garbage, of course. <laughs> so skunks, realizing that people were leaving their trash everywhere, their compost and things like that, skunks had a field day with people moving into Vermont. Skunks now will just live in trash piles, and they're so lazy that a lot of times they, they won't even really leave their trash pile. <laughs> they're pretty incredible animals, and there are more skunks today than there used to be in Vermont because of human trash, human waste. Um, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> Another animal that almost went extinct here is the porcupine. Now, the porcupine has a little bit of a more interesting history about why they went extinct, because they weren't hunted for their furs. Humans never really shot them unless they were chewing on your house. Beavers are related, or I'm sorry, did I say beavers? These are porcupines, duh. <laughs> porcupines are related to beavers though, and just like beavers, they eat bark. So you can see here on the top left, this is a tree that the bark has been eaten by a beaver, right? They strip away the bark and they're very good climbers. They started to go extinct in Vermont, not because they were hunted, but because humans changed the environment. I'm gonna go forward a little bit to show you this picture. The picture on the left is from the mid 1800s, right before the Civil War. The picture on the right is taken from exactly the same place at exactly the same angle, but it was taken just a couple of years ago in 2017. So these are exactly the same picture taken at two very different points in history. And you can see on the left, the major difference, look at how many trees there are. About 80% of all the trees in Vermont were cut down at one point or another. Porcupines, which rely on these trees for food, there's still enough trees here in this left picture for them to eat, but imagine if they were eating the bark on one tree and then they had to cross this big open field, this farmer's field to get to the next tree. Porcupines are covered in, in in uh, nice defensive quills, but there are lots of predators that still do eat porcupine, like fisher and eagles. Well, not bald eagles, but golden eagles. And if a porcupine has to waddle very slowly across this big open field, that's very dangerous for them. There's a very good chance that they could get picked off by a predator. So just by changing the land itself, we actually accidentally ended up killing thousands of porcupines. But now that today there are fewer farms in Vermont, and Vermont looks more like this picture on the right, porcupines have a much easier time surviving because this on the right is like the perfect environment for a porcupine, whereas the picture on the left is a very dangerous environment for the porcupine. Now, get back a little bit. The moose, we'll talk about the moose a little bit later. The moose is the most recent example of an animal that becoming endangered because, again, I'll talk about it at the very end, but it has to do with ticks. You guys might've heard about this. Ticks are only just now making their way into Vermont because as the earth warms up, as global warming occurs, ticks don't like cold places. But as Vermont starts to warm up, ticks are moving slowly into Vermont because they can start to survive the winters here as they get shorter. Moose have never had to deal with ticks before. And as a result, they don't have any kind of immunity to the ticks. They don't have strategies for dealing with the ticks. So the ticks are really starting to kill the moose. And we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But this is a great, this is one of my favorite stories here. So you guys might know that wolves used to live all across Vermont here. But today, it is impossible to find a wolf. They do not exist here anymore. Instead, what we find are, we call them coyotes, like this coyote here on the right, but they aren't truly coyotes. Coyotes are a type of canine, so related to the wolf, that lives in the Western United States in the prairie states where there are very few trees and lots of open grasslands. What we have today in Vermont is this guy. <laughs> so this is the pelt of a, what we would call a koi dog or a koi wolf. 
It's neither a coyote nor a wolf. It's a mix between the two. It's a hybrid. Wolves, the way to tell a wolf from a coyote is that wolves have rounded ears. Coyotes have pointed ears. Wolves have darker coats, and they also have bigger snouts. You can tell just by looking at the head of this koi dog, his ears, they're not pointy like the coyote's ears. They're rounded. And he has a bigger snout, kind of like a dog's snout. And its fur is quite dark. And it's much larger than a normal coyote that lives out in the plains. So this is like a hybrid. You guys know how there are mixed dog breeds, right? Like a labradoodle. <laughs> the koi dog is like the natural labradoodle that lives here in Vermont. And the reason why we have them is that as settlers started to build farms in Vermont and raising cows and sheep and other animals, defenseless animals, the wolves began to realize that this was like free food. They could go into any farmer's field that they want and they could kill a calf or a sheep without that animal fighting back at all. And wolves killed so many farm animals, farmers obviously got very angry with them. And farmers and hunters and everybody in Vermont started to kill wolves on site because they were dangerous for farmers. As a result, lots of the wolves that did live in Vermont were killed and wolves are intelligent animals and were able to realize that Vermont was not a safe place for them to live anymore. So they started to leave, to move out to Canada and to different states but at the same time that the wolves were moving out, coyotes were starting to move into Vermont. Like we were saying, coyotes live in the prairies where there's lots of grass and open land. They couldn't live in Vermont because before this, Vermont was a big forest. There wasn't any open land. But farmers, when they were cutting down the trees to build homes and to build pasture for their animals, they created a lot of open space. And those places were perfect for coyotes to live. They realized that they could come and move into Vermont and live here happily. So as the coyotes were moving into Vermont and the wolves were moving out, they met up with one another. And because they're both canines, they're both dogs, they interbred, they crossbred. And all of the coyotes that live in Vermont today are their ancestors. They're the mixed koi dogs that we find today. So that's a pretty, very interesting and very special story about how we got these animals. They're, they're kind of unique to uh, this area, to New England, the koi dog. So <laughs> here's a picture of one. You can, kind of, you can kind of tell that he's smaller than a wolf, but bigger than a, bigger than a coyote. Um, he's got the rounded ears like a wolf. They're, they're kind of beautiful animals, really. They're still a nuisance. They do still... Uh, you know, kill pets and farm animals sometimes, but this is, some of you guys might know this as a catamount or a mountain lion. This is the last mountain lion that was shot in, in Barnet, Vermont, in Caledonia County. Uh, and this picture is from 18, the 1880s. Since then, nobody has hunted any of these animals. Um, they've mostly left Mountain lions, you can still find a couple of them in remote places in Vermont, but mountain lions refuse to live anywhere near humans. They'll try to get as far away from any human settlement as possible. Uh, and so that's why we don't see them nowadays anymore. But they used to be a top predator here in Vermont. And, and very large too. You can see that he's just about as tall as that man is in the photo there. These are some blurry pictures, but these are of St. Johnsbury from the St. Johnsbury Town Forest, the hill behind St. Johnsbury. And you can see from these pictures, it's kind of hard to tell because of how blurry it is, but there are almost no trees in these whole photos. If you can see my cursor here in this photo, there's just a couple trees right here and then a couple trees off in the background in the hills. Again, 80% of the trees that you see today in Vermont used to be cut down back in the 17 and 1800s. There was much more open land back then for farms, but then also because people were cutting down that lumber to sell it. Now, people still do that today. Some of you probably know, maybe somebody in your family who's a lumberjack who sells wood. But back then, like we saw in this picture, there was a whole lot more of that going on. So again, 
in these two top pictures, these are the exact same photo taken at two different times in history from the exact same place. And you can just see how many more trees there are on the, on the right photo today than there were back then. The reason that we cut down those trees is to make lots of different products. This is potash, which is basically like burned down tree resin, uh, which was used in things like soap. But also we cut down those trees, of course, to make farms. And this is a merino sheep. Back around the time of the Civil War, there were, what is it, six million merino sheep in Vermont. That means that there were 10 times more sheep than there are people in Vermont today. That would be like every single person in the whole state getting 10 sheep for them to keep. It's really incredible. There were so many of these sheep and here in Vermont, we sold their wool to make clothing. They have very nice wool. But over time, this industry kind of died out because you could raise these sheep much more cheaply in the Western states or in other parts of the country. So now we don't see any of these Merino sheep, but there was a time where you really wouldn't be able to, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to walk very far without seeing quite a few of them. Six million sheep, that's a whole lot. <laughs> Here's the, the result of logging. This is a, a clear cut, which means that every single tree in this area is cut down, right? And so they've taken the useful wood away and now all that you see here is the scrap wood. Nowadays, what you have to do if, you're, uh, if you run a lumber camp, if you cut down all these trees, you have to clear away all the scraps and you have to plant a certain number of replacement trees, right? So that we're not just cutting down trees and ruining the environment, we're replacing all of the wood that we take. It only takes about 50 years for a softwood tree um, like these conifers to regrow to adult size. So it's really, if it's done properly, logging is, not super dangerous to the environment, particularly if you're only cutting down some of the trees in the area. Like you can see in this picture that they're letting the largest and oldest trees survive, and they're cutting down some of the younger adult trees to sell. But they're not cutting down every single tree like in the last photo. This is an even healthier way to do logging. <laughs> but this is the, one of the last things that we'll have the chance to talk about here, but this is one of the most, uh, I guess the, the thing that we did here in Vermont that changed the environment the most. And this was after the Civil War, when all of the soldiers came back to Vermont after the war, they started up this massive industry of cutting down Vermont trees and shipping them down the Connecticut River to Connecticut, where all these trees were used to build big ships, mostly a lot of warships, but also passenger ships and mail ships and things like that. This, this picture is actually an image of the Connecticut River, but you can't see the water at all. It's jam-packed with logs. <laughs> this is what we call a log drive, right? All of these logs are being floated down the Connecticut River, hundreds of miles from Northern Vermont, down to the mouth of the Connecticut River where it empties into Long Island Sound. So there are thousands of logs in the river right now, but there are even, even more thousands of logs all stacked up at this logging camp here that are waiting to be put down into the river. There were all different kinds of men who worked on these logging runs. These are some of the river men here. They had an incredibly dangerous job where they had to balance on top of all of these logs that were floating down the river. And it was their job to make sure that all the logs kept flowing. In the picture here, you can see what we call a log jam. All of the logs have stopped moving because they've all bunched up with one another and interlocked and they kind of clog the river. It's these guys' job to, they have big pick poles and they have to push the logs and move the logs to free them so that they flow down the river. If you had this job and if you fell off of one of these logs and into the water, you could get crushed instantly and die or get trapped under the water and drown. It was incredibly dangerous. It was one of the most dangerous jobs that existed. 
<laughs> but people were paid pretty good money to do it. If you've ever seen people balancing on a log that's floating or rolling on a log, uh, those games were basically, they, these men came up with those games because it was their job to try to balance on these logs without falling into the water. <laughs> Here, here's a picture of some of those logs as they were being cut down and, and brought to the river. And I just want you to look at how look at how large those timbers are. Those timbers have to be at, at least four or five feet in diameter. It would be very hard to find wild trees in Vermont today that are that large. We cut down pretty much all of these massive, massive timbers to build ships. Massive ships need massive logs, of course, down in Connecticut. So we cut down pretty much all, of, every single one of them. It'll take hundreds of years to get the right environment here in Vermont to replace these trees. We won't see these trees again, probably it, it, even still in our lifetime. It's taken this long for them to come back. So these are really very special trees that these people were cutting down and selling uh, but back then, they, they didn't really realize that. It wasn't something that they thought about. Eventually, steam trains and the railroads that, of course, connect them across the country came to Vermont. And then we didn't need to ship things down the river anymore. We could ship them by train. And also, as a result, we could ship very heavy things, even heavier than those big timbers, right? This is a slate quarry up in Vermont. Um, where is this? I think it says, yeah, in Fairhaven. You might have heard that uh, New Hampshire, their motto is the granite state, right? Well, Vermont is also a granite state. <laughs> there is a, tons and tons of very valuable, very nice granite and also slate, as you can see here, here in the state. If you've ever driven down uh, Highway 93 into New Hampshire, Franconia Notch, and you've seen Cannon Mountain and Mount Lafayette, those two mountains that look like they split apart, they used to be a super volcano, a massive volcano thousands of years ago that erupted and basically covered all of Northern Vermont in lava. And that lava became granite over thousands of years. It's pretty amazing. What we're living on top of right now, if you live in Northern Vermont, is ancient lava from that giant volcano, which is kind of hard to think about. Right? You, don't, you certainly don't think about volcanoes when you think about Vermont, but maybe you should. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, I love this picture because this is a picture of the 1960s, which isn't that long ago, uh, less than 100 years ago. And it's a picture of highway construction when they were building the interstates through Vermont. And here they had to blast out these big, basically bedrock boulders they had to blast them apart so that the highway could run through them. But if you've ever been to Lake Willoughby, this might be a little bit of a familiar sight to you. These blasted apart walls look just about exactly like those mountains on either side of Lake Willoughby that were cut through by the glacier. Nowadays, humans, we have the same amount of, of power to basically do the same kind of change that the massive glacier did in Vermont thousands and thousands of years ago. So we can split apart the rocks like this and, and change the direction of rivers. And we, can, we have the power to destroy the environment and also to save the environment, right? So nowadays, whenever we build a bridge like this, you have to make absolutely sure that the bridge is safe for the environment. Otherwise, the government of Vermont won't let you build that bridge. So even though we're still changing the environment today, we're not gonna talk about some of this, we're changing it in a healthy way. And now it's become our responsibility to really be nature's doctor a little bit. There's quite a few diseases and pests that humans have unfortunately brought to Vermont and now it's our job to remove them. You guys may have heard of invasive species, right? They're animals or plants that come from other parts of the country or other parts of the world and that don't belong in Vermont. And in fact, they cause a lot of problems because they're living here when they're not supposed to. So these two beetles, they don't look particularly dangerous, but the, the green colored guy on the top left, that's an emerald ash borer. 
You might have heard of this beetle. It's young, it's larva, the little worm babies that it make. They drill, these are called galleries, these little winding passages through the bark of ash trees. You guys might have found in the past a log or a dead tree that has these galleries drilled through it, these little squiggly tunnels. Those are made by those, the baby insects and they actually kill the tree. That part of the tree, the inner bark, is basically is where the xylem and the phloem of the tree are. That's basically the veins and arteries of the tree that take water and sap up and down the tree to wherever it needs it. These beetles destroy those veins and arteries and they make the tree die, which is, you know, <laughs> it's pretty sad. And they mostly target ash trees. Ash trees, because of this beetle, ash trees are now endangered in Vermont. And in the next hundred years or so, if we don't stop this beetle, it could kill every single ash tree in all of Vermont, and you'll never see one again, which is very sad. On the other hand, over here, this Asian longhorn beetle, sorry, uh, with the black and white spots, it's a similar beetle, obviously from Asia, and it targets a couple other kinds of trees, but mostly maple trees. And you guys know that people in Vermont rely on maple trees for industry, to make their money, to sell maple syrup. So if, if we continue to let this beetle kill our maple trees, the people in Vermont are going to lose a lot of money. So not only is it important to get rid of these beetles for the sake of the trees, but also for our own sake so that we can continue living here, right? This is the last slide. I just wanna quickly talk about the ticks because this is the most recent problem with the environment with the ticks and the moose. This picture of the moose that you see on the left is what's called a ghost moose. You can see he's missing a lot of fur. He almost looks kind of ghostly. He's also very thin. It's hard to tell with the moose because they're so big. But when ticks attack a moose, a moose is so big that ticks can actually reproduce while they're still on the moose. And there could be 10,000 ticks or more on one single moose. That's terrible that they're sucking a lot of blood out of that animal. White-tailed deer have adapted to deal with ticks because they live in parts of the country where ticks have always lived. And so deer actually know how to groom themselves and actually groom one another and will pick deer off of each other to help, you know, to make sure that the deer don't hurt them. But moose don't know how to do that. And they're also not very social. So they can't pick the ticks off of one another. Instead, what they do, which is not a very smart idea, is they will scrape up against trees to try to scrape the ticks off of them. But in the process of doing that, they scrape off a lot of their fur too, like you can see here. And of course, when the winter time rolls around, if this moose is missing half of its fur, that fur is essential to protecting that moose from the cold weather and the, the wet also here in Vermont. Without all of that fur, the moose could get hypothermia and die, especially if it's already missing a lot of blood from, from those ticks. So this is a brand new environmental problem that humans have had a hand in causing because we are burning up the earth by burning fossil fuels and things like that. And that's allowed the ticks to attack these moose. And we need to find a way to, <laughs> to make sure that the moose can adapt and deal with these ticks. Otherwise, the moose themselves might become endangered here in Vermont. So that, that's the last thing I'm, I'll tell you today, and it's kind of a call to action. We have to be really aware of the way that we've changed the environment and our obligations, the things that we have to do to help the environment recover over time, right? So thank you guys. Thank you guys all for tuning into my class today about uh, the natural history of Vermont and how humans have changed Vermont over time. Thank you so much, Michael. That was great and you put a lot of energy and effort into that. It looks like you had answered all the, the questions as you went along. Um, and uh, just to let our viewers know that we will be back next week uh, with more classes. So please feel free to look on our website at our virtual learning page and uh, look for more classes like these. Uh, thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you all.